Hello everyone! To understand Taranzu's story, we'll first have to go way back in time to the moment that the Titans found Azeroth. For those that don't know, the Titans have a mission of bringing order to the universe and at the time Azeroth was infected with Old Gods. Old Gods are beings of chaos, so the Titans made it their mission to clean up the planet and shape the worlds. In the area that we now call Pandaria, they encountered the Old God Yasharaj and his mented minions. The Titans forces, amongst them the Mogu who were led by Raden, they battled with Yasharaj and they actually managed to kill him. In his final moments, Yasharaj unleashed his final breath attack, which infected the land with the Shah. The Shah are powerful beings that feed on emotions, and when they have enough power, they rise up out of the very soil of the land. The Titans placed Yasharaj's heart in a container, because his heart was still left, and they hid it away far beneath the land. They then resumed cleaning the rest of the planet, since there were more old gods out there, and it's my interpretation that killing Yasharaj showed them that killing old gods is a bad idea. If all the old gods would infect the land upon their death, then the whole mission would fail, so the Titans decided to imprison the remaining old gods instead of of killing them. This kind of conflicts with Cthulhu's story, but that's the best I can make of it. Either way, the Titans they cleaned up the planets, they shaped the world with the help of Mogu and other creations, and they left the world of Kalimdor for life to evolve and grow. The Mogu were left behind to guard the great work of the Titans, which was needed since not all the Mantis were killed and Pandaria had more threats to deal with, like the Yongul. But over time, the Curse of Flesh would affect them just like it did with nearly all the other Titanic creations. The Curse of Flesh is a curse used by the Old Gods to transform Titan creations like the Mogu or the Irvan and morph them from beings made out of metal or stone to beings made out of flesh. This way, they would become more vulnerable for corruption and with it came emotions like pride, greed, fear and anger. Because of this curse, the Mogu forgot about the original mission. They started to fight amongst each other and instead of protecting, they started to enslave and dominate. In time, they would find a way to return their bodies to stone, but the damage from the old gods was already done. I truly believe now that the Mogu thought they were doing the work of the Titans. They fought against the Mantid and used the powers of the Veil to create new life. Oh, but such terrible works. Amongst the races that they enslaved were the Pandaren, who were forced to serve the Mogul masters. Countless lives were thrown away as they were forced to build the Serpent Spine, that great wall that you see in the game. And while they were building it, they meant it they constantly attacked. For millennia, the Pandaren were slaves and they couldn't fight back since they weren't allowed to have any weapons. That all changed when Kang, Fist of the First Dawn, the first Pandaren monk, stood up and had enough. With his own body as a weapon, his own paws, he managed to liberate himself, his brothers and sisters, and he taught them his ways. He showed them that the Mogu held no power over them, and that deep inside they all had the strength to stand up and take control. This marked the end of the Mogu Empire, and from that moment on, Pandaria was ruled by Pandaren emperors. Emperor after emperor succeeded each other until around 10,000 years ago, where Emperor Shaohao took his place upon the throne. It was tradition for the new emperor to go and talk to the great elder Jinyu, who would see into the future and tell the emperor what was waiting for him. To Shaohao's horror, the water speaker spoke not of a great future, instead he spoke of an elven kingdom, a war with demons, and the great land of Kalam door splitting apart. In search of wisdom as to what to do next, how best to protect his people, Shao Hao talked to the Jade Serpent, who told him that he had to cleanse himself of his burdens. At first Shao Hao, he, he didn't know how to do this, but his friend the Monkey King, he made him a mask. Upon placing the mask on his face, his fears or his doubts would pour out of him and manifest into powerful Sha. Each major Sha that the Emperor killed took away a burden and lightened his spirit, and part of his challenge was given to him by the White Tiger. The White Tiger decided to gather together the greatest warriors of Pandaria to test Shao Hao's strength. Emperor Shao Hao was given a 10 foot pole and was challenged to strike one of the warriors. For hours they fought, but the warriors were too quick and too nimble for the untrained emperor. He grew angry, he cursed and finally broke the staff over his knee. Humbled, the emperor asked the white tiger what was wrong and learned that his own passions made him weak. To save Pandaria, Shao Hao would have to combat his own anger hatred and violence. The Monkey King sprang into action and carved three masks. The Emperor wore each mask in turn and with the help of his friends, as well as the greatest warriors of Pandaria, the Shah of Anger 
the Shah of Hatreds and the Shah of Violence were defeated and imprisoned beneath the ground. The Emperor was forever changed and as he set forth on the final leg on his adventure, he was a creature of patience, love and peace. With his victory he had cleansed himself of the six burdens, but the Emperor realized that the Shah would forever be a threat to Pandaria. In order to contain this threat and assure the people's safety, an organization was formed, the Shadow Pen, right there and then. The greatest warriors Pandaria had to offer kneeled down and spoke an oath to the last emperor. And from that moment, the same words have been spoken by every Shadow Pen initiate for the last 10,000 years. We are the sword in the shadows. We are the watchers on the wall. The shield that guards the realms of men. Xiao Hao left them to fulfill his destiny. As the War of the Ancients came to an end, the Well of Eternity imploded and the land of Kalimdor split apart, Xiao Hao became one with the land. Pandaria drifted safely out into the ocean and a great mist covered the land, hiding it from the rest of the world. The Shadow Pen would keep watch over the land of Pandaria. They are the first and the last line of defense, keeping the land safe not only against the Shah, but also from the Yongle and the Mantid invasions. Before someone can join their organization, they first have to undertake the Trials of the Red Blossoms. This trial consists of three tests. The test of resolve, the test of strength and the test of spirit. And these tests are not easy. In a short story on the WoW website, they told about a test where initiates were forced to swim in an icy lake and grab a coin from a fire. Nearly all of the new initiates they died from this first test and those that survived had the pleasure of the second test. In the short story, the second test was fighting a cobra and a tiger without any weapons. They had hidden the weapons behind a large bell or under the large bell. They had to lift the bell, they had to do a whole scheme, Sha appeared was a terrible battle. They never described the third test because normal initiates don't have to fight the Shah, but it was clear that only the best of the best are allowed to call themselves members of the Shadow Pan. The finest warriors Pandaria has to offer, and they all answer to one man. Taran Zhu, leader of the Shadow Pan. Not much is known about Taran Zhu's life before the Alliance and Horde reached Pandaria. We don't know exactly how old he is, it's hinted that he's very old, but we're not sure how old, or how he became the leader, or why he became the leader. What we do know is the moment that we set foot on land, that's the moment that we caused Taran Zhu a whole bunch of trouble. For centuries, the Shadow Pan was able to defend the land and keep the Shah under control, but our untamed emotions, they fed the Shah, and they gave it enough strength to break out and cause havoc across the land. He flies out and he warns us the moment that we set foot on land. Maybe they did deserve to die. Beasts! What sort of madness is this? Men, stand down! This is one of the natives. We are from the Alliance and mean you no harm. Tell me, what was that shadow you drew out of me? This is not the place to explain. In short, your own doubts have been made manifest as a consequence of your actions. You don't understand. We're fighting a war here. Oh, I understand perfectly. I have eyes. But Pandaria is not like whatever land you came from. It lives and breathes. You should be careful what kind of energy you bring here. Now put those weapons away! They all must die. You, bear creature, what kind of sorcery was this? Stranger, Blood and thunder have been made manifest. Pandaria is not like whatever land you come from. It lives and breathes. You should be careful what kind of energy you bring here. Ha! Huh. We bring only our honor and the desire to crush our enemies. Ugh. Have your kind been aiding the Alliance? It is not our desire to get wrapped up in your bloodshed. Now have your men lower their weapons, or you will face two enemies on this continent. Better off. If it is war you mean to bring to our shores, 
The very land itself will respond to your passions and your violence. I do not know what the ultimate consequences will be. Nobody does. Look tall, friend. You may give these soldiers quarter at your discretion, but we are not choosing sides. This conflict is little more than a race war. Their hatred would engulf this land. We will have no part in this. Taranzu doesn't like us in the war that we brought to his land, but you can't reverse time. Feeding the Shah has caused a whole bunch of trouble with the Mented evading before the regular schedule, Mogu using the opportunity to strike, Shah corrupting nearly everything, so we do our best to clean up our mess. Eventually, we reach the point where Enduin, he tries to convince the White Tiger to open the gates to the Veil of Eternal Blossoms. Soon, they will overwhelm this continent. Where do we draw the line? We're here to lend our aid. We can help protect the Vale. We have witnessed your help in the Jade Forest. This horde, this alliance of yours. You have no control over your own nature. You leave misery in your wake. They are scarred, yes. But they have learned much. I trust them. You are making a terrible mistake. It is decided. I will open the gates. The Veil of Eternal Blossoms will be open for all. Apparently, allowing us access into the Veil pissed off Taranzu, and on Pandaria, you don't want to let your emotions run free. The Shah of Hatred corrupts Taranzu, and ironically, we are the ones who cleanse him of his corruption. No! No! The Shah of Hatred has fled my body, and the monastery as well. I must thank you, strangers. The Shadowpan are in your debt. Now, there is much work to be done. Saving his life gives him a little bit more trust in us, and he allows us to join him while he gathers his troops in Taolong steps, he hunts the Shah of Hatred, and eventually defeats him. This is your moment, Shadowpan. This is everything that you have trained for. In game from that moment on we wouldn't really hear about Taranzu until the rise of the Thunder King but he did play a part in the novel Vol'jin Shadows of the Horde and this story takes place right after Vol'jin's assassination. He's found by his old friend Chen Stormstout who takes him to the Shadowpan Monastery. Taranzu doesn't really want to get involved with the Horde Alliance warfare but he allows Vol'jin to stay because they have another guest. A human hunter named Tirafan was also wounded during the war, found by Chen and brought to the monastery. Vol'jin and Tirafan Tirafan both represent a part of the Pandaren philosophy and Taranzu, he has the plan in mind of putting them together and trying to balance each other out. At the same time he also wants to study them, perhaps he can learn something from them and in return they can learn something from the Pandaren. The story, as the title suggests, is mainly focused on Vol'jin and his path to the 5.3 Rebellion. What we learn about Taranzu is that he's very philosophic, which helped Vol'jin on his path. He taught Vol'jin how to break bricks with his hands, and we know that Taranzu is one hell of a fighter. The Zandalari are working together with the Thunder King, and they're planning an invasion of Pandaria. Near the end of the story, they decide to attack the Shadow Pen Monastery, where 33 defenders had to hold off against an army of Zandalari. Both sides, they lose people in this battle. Vol'jin takes a few hits, but Taranzu didn't even show signs of fighting. He was definitely fighting, but he was just so good that nobody could touch him. They managed to defeat the Zandalari to win the fight, and Vol'jin's time spent in the monastery had taught him more about himself. He could have left the Horde and joined the Zandalari, or he could have stayed in the Shadowpen Monastery, but Vol'jin decided that that wasn't him. That he at least had to try, had to lead the rebellion against Garrosh, and try to help his people help his beloved Horde. Vol'jin's path was clear at that point, but there was still the threat of the Thunder King that Taranzu would have to deal with. His name, Lei Shen, the Thunder King. Members of both the Alliance and the Horde lay siege on the Isle of Thunder. Piece by piece, they unlocked the island with the help of the Shadow Pen to make their way to the Thunder King. Jaina was leading the Alliance forces, and she was still pissed about the Horde using Dalaran to steal the Divine Bell. Lord Fumar was leading the Horde forces, and he was still pissed with Jaina about imprisoning and killing his people. The Thunder King also didn't just sit back and wait for us to come to him. He had Shambu summon Nalak the Stormlord, which Taranzu tried to prevent. 
I tire of your insolence. Kill him. I will take the life from you, impudent slave. Finish him. Uh, no! My emperor! My emperor! I have failed you. you. See, no power of this world can trample the pure of Your spirit. Duke, the Alliance, the Horde, all chaos is about to erupt out here. Oh, my children. Toshi, hand me my weapon. My lord, you are gravely wounded. My weapon! Champion, with me. I want you to see this. Hand over the Archmage, and I may yet allow you to walk out of here, Lorthamar! Proudmoor! You will release my people from the Violet Hold, or I will cut you down myself! Your people are legitimate prisoners of war! They orchestrated an attack on Darnassus, from my city! The Sun Reavers knew nothing of Garrosh's raid on Darnassus! Enough! There will be no more bloodshed today! I see now why your alliance and your horde cannot stop fighting. Every reprisal is itself an act of aggression, and every act of aggression triggers immediate reprisal. They I have must protect my sovereign every people. Attempt at peace. Silence! You must break the cycle. It ends today. Here, the cycle ends when you, Regent Lord, and you, Lady Proudmoor, turn from one another and walk away. Rangers, lower your weapons. My lord! Very well. We will stand down. They killed my husband. This won't bring him back. But know this, Blood Elf. There can be no peace while Hellscream is War Chief of the Horde. That is precisely why I wish to conserve our strength today. Lady? Lord. Gather the wounded. Withdraw to the harbor. Everyone, regroup back at the camp. Our work here is done. Lord Zoo! Champion, this ceasefire may not last, but remember what you have seen today. Jane and Lorfamar agreed to put down their weapons and save their strength for Garage. The Alliance and the Horde take care of business, they kill Nalak, they kill Thunder King, they kill all his minions, while Taranzu recovers from his wounds. Unfortunately, there's no rest for the wicked. The next patch, Garrosh sends his goblins to mine within the sacred veil of Pandaria. The very thing Taranzu feared now became a reality, and he was ready to kick the horde out of Pandaria. Taran, what have your people done? You've dredged open a scar within our sacred veil. Lord Zu, please understand. The Orc Warchief who ordered the deed no longer speaks for the whole of the Horde. Many voices are rising up against him. Your politics are no concern of mine. Your Horde has disrespected the sanctity of this place. You are no longer welcome here. Leave at once. Give us the opportunity to bring Garros to justice. Son Walker, I respect your people. You have aided us in our campaign against the Shah and the Thunder King. Otherwise, I would have already ordered the Shadow Pan to purge this entire shrine. But my patience is at an end. The Horde must leave. Please, give us time to make this right. Very well. You have until season's end. No longer. We Pandaren are no strangers to dealing with tyrants. The coming battle will try your souls. May the Celestials guide your actions. Sunwalker Desco managed to convince him to give them time to make this all right, which Taranzu agreed to because the Horde did help him out. Vol'jin led the rebellion in the Barrens, while Desco failed horribly at his task. Garrosh had found what he was looking for, namely the heart of the old Gaja Shiraj, and Taranzu, despite his wounds, was forced to take action. Run, run.
rampant for far too long, Hell Scream. But that stops now. <laughs> Step aside, Pandaren. You confront a force beyond reckoning. Your father dabbled in powers beyond reckoning. Where is he now? <laughs> And others! You are nothing like them! They are no longer part of my horde! <coughs> the world will hear of this. <coughs> they will come for you. Yes. I'm counting on it. The armies of the world will come for me. And within my fortress, they will face all the terrible creatures I have wrought. The boundless power I have mastered. And one by one, they will fall at my feet. Anyone who would rise against my new horde will be impaled upon the spires of Orgrimmar! You, Pandaren, tried to bury your hate and your anger, but such power cannot be contained. It must be unleashed! Time will come when you will answer for your crimes. I answer to no one! That one line about Garrosh's father is the best thing in the entire expansion and some of you had already asked how could Torrenzu possibly know? He could have known this because he had interacted with Alliance and Horde, he had interacted with Vol'jin. There are many ways that Torrenzu could have gained this information. Despite taunting Garrosh, despite delivering an awesome one-liner, he did manage to get his foot stuck in the bridge and he got his ass kicked. Dumping the heart in the pool caused a gigantic explosion which scarred the veil and killed countless Pandoran. Miraculously, Torrenzu, he survived being impaled by Gorhal, he survived the explosion and he somehow made his way to the chamber that used to contain the heart of Yasharaj. Now the newly formed Shah of Pride stood in the chamber and the adventurers together with Lorewalker Cho they find Taranzu. <coughs> oh. Cho, the outsiders, they did this. We should never have let them in. We get the full blame for Garrosh's actions, so we get to clean up his mess. Lorewalker Cho takes Taranzu away, while the adventurers kill the Shah. They then siege Orgrimmar, took on countless members of the True Horde, until they finally reached its war chief. And Garrosh absorbs the full powers of the old god Yasharaj, but we still manage to defeat him. You disappoint me, Garrosh. You are not worthy of your father's legacy. His punishment is not for you alone to decide. I won't let you take him. We have all suffered from his atrocities. My people, more than any other. Let him stand trial in Pandaria. There, we will meet out justice for all.
The day is saved, Yashiraj is no more, and Garrosh is put on trial. This is where the story of Taranzu ends for the moment, but next month the new novel War Crimes, written by Christy Golden, will be released. That novel will explain the events between the trial and the new expansion Warlords of Draenor, and a sneak peek revealed that Taranzu will read the charges placed against Garrosh. We don't know the full details about the novel yet, I can't wait to read it, but yeah, we'll have to wait for May and read the story. As a final note for Taran Zhu's story, some people really don't like the character of Taran Zhu. As always, there are several reasons for it, and I can only talk for myself. Personally, I didn't really mind Taran Zhu. He was a grumpy bear at first when we invaded Pandaria, but he was grumpy with a good reason. Alliance and Horde empowered the Shah, and they pretty much messed up anything peaceful that Pandaria had going. I would also be pretty pissed when someone would just barge in and mess up my house. Later we have to save him from the Shah, which is pretty funny considering that he leads the organization that fights the Shah. So be it, Taranzu had to like us, what better way than to save his life? My main problem with his character and with the story of Mr. Pandaria in general is that he tries to apply Pandaran wisdom to the overall story. He says that the Lions and Horde are children, that they just keep on fighting, and this works if you only look at the story of Mist as a single story. But WoW is not just one expansion. The Pandaran never had to face the Burning Legion, or the Scourge, or real old gods, or anything and everything that we had to unite against. It's easy to preach about keeping the peace when you can hide away behind the mist, but when events are manipulated, when external forces are constantly pushing you to fight each other, it becomes a little bit more difficult. They try to make him look like this wise Pandaren, this all-knowing Pandaren, while in reality he doesn't know anything. You know nothing, Taranzu. Also that last line at the end of the siege that his people suffered the most at the hands of Hellscream. Again this works if you take Mr. Pandaria and just look at it as a single item, but I was thinking to myself and I thought, well, I mean, Jaina might have something to say about that. I mean, she lost Fedamore. Alliance had lost countless of lives fighting Garrosh Hellscream. Horde had an internal conflict amongst each other. They lost Cairn, they lost countless of lives. Are you sure that Garrosh did the most damage to the Pandaren? I mean, he blew up the Veil of Eternal Blossoms, but the Veil is going to heal again. He killed a bunch of Pandarens, but he killed a bunch of everything, so... My question is, what exactly did he do to the Pandaren that was worse than what he did to the Alliance and the Horde? So that's, yeah, that's, that's just my interpretation of Taranzu, and feel free to call me an idiot, feel free that I don't get the story, that's, that's just my opinion, as I saw the story unfolding. Either way, this is the end of the story of Taranzu, at least for the moment. Thank you very much for watching everyone, subscribe if you like my videos, and until next time guys, see ya!